I've known Nolan, um, not when I worked at Atari Research. I was at Atari Research in 84, but I met him after that. And I had this lovely uh, experience getting to know him um, uh, in, and, uh, and writing a little bit about him for, uh, for, um, for, for uh, ACM Computer and getting to learn uh, that even though he lived in a mansion, the place that he did all of his, spent all of his time was a basement with a ceiling that you could barely stand in, full of gigantic amounts of papers, books, and every other kind of detritus uh, possible. Um, and uh, when he went upstairs, of course, the six children running around and uh, uh, Chopin's uh, uh, his own personal piano was in was in evidence. But uh, Nolan uh, Nolan is a, is a person with a lot of imagination, as you'll learn tonight, and a lot of uh, um, uh, dreams that he wants to make come true and has made many come true. So Nolan, without any further ado, tell us uh, what, what is user experience and how, how has it changed? How has it come to come into your life? Well, I think that the user inter interface world was always very important to me because what I learned in the very dawning of the of the coin-operated computer game business, Pong, computer space, what have you, that the user interface was extremely important because in the coin-op business, there's no instruction manuals. People have to be able to intuit how to play the game literally in the first 10, 15 seconds of play. And so it was very important that the user interface be intuitive, and gave the right information at the right time and was directly linked into the game. And, uh, and then I started to play with other controllers. And like a touchscreen is really good at a scaler, at a point. You touch and you see a point. Not very good at a vector. You know, and and very, very, very poor at a vector with velocity, and so that user interface is much better with the trackball. And then you have a joystick where you can get a vector, kinda, but generally not velocity. So all of these things turned out to be trade-offs. Pong, if you don't play it with a with a knob, is not that much fun. You know, so. There hasn't been a good Pong clone on a, on a, on a cell phone because it's basically, you know, the wrong user interface. I think that um, as you design, you always want to get simplicity to the extent that you can. And uh, that's been kind of my, uh, my touchstone as I develop things. Doing work right now in the education space, in the NFT space, and dealing with educational software. And the objective is to create games that, are, that teach so that you get the addictiveness of a, of a video game. You get players into the flow state. And that, and then you get uh, the ability to teach them something. And our early attempts at that are yielding incredible results. I think we're actually going to build schools that can teach 10 times faster with significantly better in retention. I always, I'd like to make the bold claim that we will create games that will teach you everything that you learned in high school in six months. So we think we can truncate five, four years of inefficient school into six months of very efficient game playing. And, uh, and then the question becomes one of, okay, if you can complete the, your high school in six months, what do you do with the other you know, three and a half 
years? And the answer is, I think you learn skills that are more relevant. I think you learn entrepreneurship. I think you learn user interface design. <laughs> you, you learn things that it's very clear that the games or the, the jobs that will be available to someone who is a six-year-old right now, many of the jobs that will be available haven't been invented yet. And that the gig economy is going to be the way to bring people into that fold and, uh, and uh, make sure that they are productive and capable citizens. Um, I think, I was just asked, have I read The Diamond Age? Absolutely, and loved it. Um, you know, it was, some people say that it was, it was actually designed um, by Alan Kay, <laughs> with the, the, the Dino book, you know, or at least science fiction authors often invent things much before their real time. And uh, so, yeah, I think, uh, the Diamond Age Dyna book construct was, was very fascinating. I'm also very interested in NFTs and cryptocurrencies right now. Um, I'm involved with a company called um, Moxie, which is about to do a significant drop of a utility token that will be used to develop games, fund games, we're developing games that are play to earn. So you can actually earn money by playing games. And uh, it's kind of a fun and wild ride. Um, I think that what we are finding right now that because of the coronavirus and so much of the world going to the Zoom play, Google Meets, what have you, that we're actually living in the metaverse very much right now. And that the metaverse is a real thing. And uh, it's going to get fleshed out. And there's a lot more fascinating things that come because for me, I feel like this world I have gotten very much more efficient than I had previously. I mean, before I was probably on an airplane 20 times, 30 times a year. And uh, I don't need to do that anymore. And yet I feel like I'm able to uh, accomplish most of the things and that, that I wish to, and, and uh, it's nice. I'm curious, in terms of feedback, what are the sorts of things that are sort of revolutionary in the user interface world right now that you guys talk about? I'd like to be a little bit of a student of you for a while, uh, for a minute. Do you have any, um, any things that are kind of revolutionary? I mean, you know, your uh, Ted, you did the, the touch point for the IBM PCs. Um, well, well, now we are in a situation where um, where my eyes are, are gazing can be stably and correctly interpreted. Where my, you know, what my, if you get it, go look at, look at Whoop. Whoop knows if I slept well last night and whether my temperature is a little warmer today and encourages me to take uh, a little easy on my exercise. That's where we are today. Um, where do we want to be? I think we want to be helping people get back to focusing and, and being able to, to, uh, to consider what they want to be doing with their time. I mean, you just told me about how you got a whole bunch of time back from yourself. I think that, you know, my, my raps always consider it systems or systems that are going to be respectful of you and help you uh, achieve your goals. So that's, 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 that's where I always go with, with what I want sensors to do. Well, one of the things that, that I'd love to do in terms of a user interface problem is I would like to hack my Peloton. And 
And I know that the software that they're using is essentially a, a uh, Android. And that what, what I'd like to be able to do is there's good feedback as to how fast I'm pedaling and how hard it, it is that I'm pedaling. I would love to be able to do it in such a way that we're, we have little controls on the handlebars so that I can actually play a game. And when I'm being chased by the bad guys, I have to pedal faster and harder. <laughs> and that the gamification of exercise is something that I think has still needs to be done. There have been a few attempts, but nothing really good or, um, or exciting. So if, um, if somebody wants to hack the Peloton, I'd, I'd love to find out how we can do that. And, and maybe, uh, maybe there's a business. I mean, Peloton should do that and offer it as a, as a extra paid option. I mean, if I were running the company, I'd sure as hell do it. Um, because the exercise world is boring and having, you know, girls in spandex yelling at you is not my idea of a good time. <laughs> yeah, I, I, well, there you go. I, I think that um, back at Atari, I saw very early on motion platforms with exercises uh, put together. And where did they go? Um, you know, and how, how do we dance together? I mean, if you take a look at something like Murder Ball, where there's this very, very intense connection between the people playing playing the game. Um, well, just you know, dance on the uh, on the Connect on the Xbox Connect or the, the thing. If you if you really want to liven up a party, just put just dance on after everybody's had two or three cocktails, and the party just devolves into hilarity. <laughs> I, I don't know. Are you acquainted with that game? What it is, it's a, you, you have the connect, which gives motion capture feedback so that several of the, the songs have four people that have to mimic the dancers on the screen. And of course, they're always behind or, or, or wrong or what have you, and you get scored on how well you've been able to do the dance. So I, I highly highly recommended as a party prop. So Ted and Nolan, I wanted to point out that some people have had their hands raised and we've got some comments in the chat and I'd be happy to share those with you. Please do. So Akil, maybe you'll come off mute yes. and talk about your graduate work. I saw your hand raised earlier. For a minute. Um, yeah, I definitely can. Hi everyone. Uh, my name's Akil. Um, so you brought up how like user interfaces are going to be expanded or like what design work. And I'm a graduate student at San Jose State uh, University. And a lot of my graduate work focuses on uh, specifically user interface design and gamification in training. And I'm really interested in training cybersecurity professionals and those um, who do like really minute, really focused um, tasks. And I believe that uh, what you said is completely accurate with Peloton as it is to training. If you've ever sat through work training, it's boring as heck. Um, so I think that the next step of user interface design and that and any training of some sort is really trying to gamify it to ultimately make it fun and make it uh, like really retain your information and ultimately make you a better employee, but also have a blast. Sure. Uh, it's a really interesting space. Yeah. The example? Um, yeah, I, can yeah. give, I can give uh, plenty, but currently, um, actually, uh, the TSA is currently working on training their employees. Um, in only in certain big, big airports, but they're uh, essentially training and focusing their employees on doing like signal detection tasks, which is um, something comes to the scanner and it doesn't fit, so you should take it out. And uh, every time it comes through that program and they click on it with the mouse, um, they get like a score. And then whoever scores the highest at the end gets like a gift card or something. And there's like cool graphics, cool simulation on uh, on the training itself. So it's still in the early stages, but it's really interesting that someone brought that up. And I think that's where like a lot of the future of user interface design is heading, at least in my, my opinion, but cool. Right, and then uh, can we get one or two more responses to what's new in interface? And then we'll go back to the talk, if that's okay. So Mitch. Uh, yeah. 
Mitch Yowitz, why don't you go ahead and then we'll be back to you, Brando. Okay. Sure. Mitch, you want to come off mute? Yeah, I was just, I thought I was just throwing it into the comments. Yeah, I think uh, starting to see things like LIDAR starting to show up as kind of default tech in phones and tablets, allowing for more accurate, precise environment awareness and tracking opens up all kinds of possibilities for uh, interaction between devices and your environment. So I think that's- Well, you know, kind of you can comment on LIDAR. I'm on the board of a self-driving software company. And the one of the issues that you have in these sensors is, I guess you guys are all techie, so I'll, I'll geek out a little bit, but there, what you really want to do is have as many sensors widely spaced as you can. And one of the problems that the Tesla has, they made a mistake. They got rid of the high sensor and they really need to have something that's higher in order to give good, good um, uh, images of things that are cross traffic. They don't have that now. And that's kind of a problem. So I believe that 30% of the cars on the road will be self-driving and this will be class five self-driving in eight years, maybe 10. And, um, but in order to do that, right now LIDAR and the sensors increase the cost of a car by almost 30,000 bucks. With quantity, it'll get down to 10, but it's still a $10,000 adder. What a lot of people don't realize is that once you have self-driving cars, you'll save more than that in the life of the car in insurance because all of a sudden fender benders go away and that's the biggest claim on, uh, on insurance. So the user interface, I guess in some ways, the, the sensors on self-driving cars, it's it's, it's a user interface for the car, but probably not for the driver. So I'm not sure it's appropriate here. <laughs> anyway, I'm geeking out a little bit. <laughs> cool. Um, Kevin Mark mentioned self-driving trucks and Kevin Burry mentioned smart contact lenses. Love smart contact lenses. Love it. Um, you know, <laughs> If you want to have a fun geek out, I, I don't remember whether it's Netflix or Amazon, but there's a series called Memories of Alhambra. So it's a science fiction story. I think it's about 10 episodes. And it's about augmented reality, AR, smart contact lenses, and gameplay in the real world. Of course, the tech goes bad and there's, there's bad things that happen, but it makes a good story. So if you, if you want to geek out on augmented reality, just, just go, go find Memories of a Hamper. It's a Korean subtitled you know, series. Cool. Somebody, oh, Brandel wanted to uh, comment here about VR HMDs. Sure, uh, but, but Nancy, I also want to make sure that Nolan gets to get into a rift at some point. Sure. Yeah. So Brandel, but Brandel's been waiting a long time, so let him shout out and then we'll go ahead. Sure, so the, the sense of fusion that you mentioned, Nolan, uh, as, as it relates to self-driving cars is also relevant in the home. Having a, a combination of multiple sensors, being able to fuse input either from TVs or a general environment or an increased number of sensors on a head. And I, I just mentioned that Oculus Quest and other devices are offering a, a, enough sensor sensing capability to be able to do full body tracking if you're standing near a mirror. And I, I think those are some pretty interesting sort of opportunities because they, they actually have user-facing uh, implications. 
Yeah, I, I, I think um, that technology is very, very good. Um, I was working with virtual reality and, and uh, maybe you know, but I'm actually looking for a system where I want to put people on zip lines in a virtual reality environment so that you're zip lining <clears throat> from the top of the Eiffel Tower to Ecole Militaire or across the Grand Canyon or over Niagara Falls. Now, when you're on a zip line, you don't necessarily have the clues that you would like to have. And so I was wondering if there was some kind of a um, tracking system. I, I have a feeling it has to be RF um, and with two or three maybe um, antennas to triangulate the position. Because all I need is position, really. I, and and I, I think that the headset will give me uh, uh, FIRO and Theta. Um, it's definitely the case that uh, that RF tracking is available for that kind of thing. If you want a large enough space, uh, you can actually have optical trackers over a reasonable space. Uh, if you need to have them at a full scale of a zip line, then the, the scope of the way that you're going to track that is going to be different. But if somebody's in a truly virtual environment, then they don't you don't necessarily need to have the full inertial consequences of traveling the full distance because we, we don't have a good sense of exactly how fast we're going, just that we're going. So you may actually be able to do it with a cut down space as well. It'd be interesting to know the levels of tolerance. So there was an organization called The Void and they used redirected walking, the, the process of, of tricking somebody to believe that they were turning, what they were walking straight when they were turning. So in, in terms of the tolerances there, um, if you're if you're uh, not uh, talking to Jeremy Balenson at the Virtual Human Interaction Lab at Stanford, then that would be a really great uh, place to start. But I, I'm, it's a really, really interesting work, and I'd, I'd love to hear more about what you're doing. With it. Cool. That'd be fun. Well, I'm, I, I feel like there's a lot of fun games that we can do outdoors. And, and you know, with virtual reality, all you need is, is Delta V. And, uh, and, and that adds a lot. And, and like you say, we're very, uh, we, we're not good at, at magnitude of delta V. And so the, the whole idea of having a small electric go-kart and put you in VR, I think we can simulate that you're in a full Mario Kart kind of environment in a relatively small area. Because you've got the delta Vs that you're creating with the, the electric car, and you just amplify it in your virtual environment. And I think that'll be really fun to do. But thanks for your feedback. Appreciate that. We could go on with more comments, but I think we should go back to your uh, main focus for tonight. Well, I'm, I'm actually not sure what my main focus is. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Nolan, there's a question um, about education that, that came up um, a couple of minutes ago. Um, that uh, uh, was, was uh, um, who under, uh, Sar uh, Sarash? Hotsmig, Hotsmig, Seropian, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, she, she asks about uh, games that teach, specifically games that teach a language. We, uh, we've done a test with, a, um, with Spanish language vocabulary. And um, we tested it on, four, four uh, on two classrooms in a Philadelphia high school. And uh, two of the Spanish one classes did not use our software. Two of the classes did. When it came to Spanish 2 the following year, they could not mix the two classes. They had the, the kids that used our software had a working vocabulary of over 2,100 words. Kids who didn't use our software had a working vocabulary of less than 150. And so language training is really in the bullseye of adaptive practice. And adaptive practice is really how you 
disguise learning and games together. So when you're using one of our softwares, you have to respond every three to five seconds. It's the response that is good. Passive is not good training, not good for learning. It's the response because that says you've had to consider. And, you know, remember, remember in college when you'd go through your textbook and you say, oh, I know that page, I know that page, and know that. You really weren't getting it positively. When you interact, when you think and have to respond, is this correct? Is this incorrect? That is the learning moment. There's also a lot of interesting work that was done by a professor of the University of Chicago called, he was Hungarian. He had a totally unpronounceable name. And I'm gonna try though. His name is Mihai Chichimihai. <laughs> and he did a lot of work on the flow state. And the flow state is one of the things that makes you makes video games attractive and addictive. And, and the flow state is you need to be challenged right up to the edge of your capability, but not more than. More than, you're frustrated. Less than, you're bored. But if you can keep that challenge right on that knife edge of flow, which games do, because as you get good at games, we make it harder. And so that we always keep you in a challenged mode. And, um, and that's really, really important for good gameplay. Yeah. Um, Nolan, what do you think about why Pokemon Go was a flash in the pan instead of, instead of taking over the world and being the way we look at every, every, every space, every place we go all the time? It was not a game. The game was not fun. It was, it was challenging and collecting is, is interesting, but, it's, but it really didn't have a game metric. And, uh, and so once you kind of been there, said it, done it, there was, no, there was no challenge other than just finding and going to a place. And that's insufficient to create a long-term addictive construct. So just kind of, do you want to go with that just a little bit further where, what would have to be added? What would, what is, what's an example of something that really has something more than just points going up and up and up that, uh, that gives you that, that gives that game feeling? I think, I think it would have been fun if you, if you got something and, an associate or somebody in your environment could challenge you and try to take it away. Conflict is, 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 found, is, is a good game construct. And so maybe, um, maybe you just create this thing where you are gaining things, but you also have a ability to lose things and to be challenged and, uh, and get better at something. And, uh, and maybe help someone else also right yeah exactly cooperation so that you you get a, a group of your buddies and you become the the baddest guys on the block <laughs> so we have uh brandon talking about active versus passive I was going to chime in with Christiana's comment from a couple minutes ago. What were some of the bad UX design fails that you've seen in your life? Oh, yeah. Good oh, question. wow. Um, we did a game that was called Pool Shark. And it was a video representation of a game of pool. And the game was virtually unplayable and then you know a lot of people don't realize that when you start out you never start out thinking you're going to create a really crappy game but the minute you get it programmed up and working 
you identify it immediately as a really bad idea. And our pool game was absolutely god awful. And, uh, and it was one where we, uh, we spent a lot of money designing it and working on it and it earned no money, zero. <laughs> But the reason it wasn't playable was, you know, it, you, you, it probably felt like a pool table, uh, right? And uh, and what was what was, and it just had no direction, no no rudder. It it turns out that that pool, by its nature, is is a game of very very tight angles and very it's it's a, it's a minutia game. If you really look at it, I mean the. The difference in the angles as the balls cream is really, really difficult. And so we could not figure out a user interface that could that could give you that feeling of precision that is necessary for the game. Those fine distinctions, you couldn't make those fine distinctions in aiming. Precisely. There's a lot of really great questions coming over the transom here. Um, you know, this, this game's focused on children and learning coding. Um, I, I, uh, I recently um, talked to a graduate student that told me that kids can plan um, in, uh, cannot plan in the physical space at two, but they can plan in the social space. So I've, I've, I would love to make a, uh, a language in the social space for young kids, children to learn from. Anyway, what do you think about uh, youth, about, about teaching programming for, for, for children? I was just, about six months ago, I was asked to judge a series of games that have been programmed in Unity by eight and 10 year olds. And they were amazingly good, amazingly good. And I really, um, I, I think that um, programming is, 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 is going to be a core skill to, for a lot of people, not everybody, but um, I, I, really, I really like to bribe my kids. And my kids all knew that I'd give them a hundred bucks back when hundred dollars was a lot of money. As soon as they could type at 50 words a minute. And as a result, they all learned how to type at 50 words a minute really quickly. Cause there were a lot of, you know, online courses and, and, and software that would teach that. And every one of them has said, dad, that was the most important thing that you had me learn because it changed the way they used, you know, software and, and, and computers, and they weren't in the hunt and peck world. So why has edutainment had such an awful, awful life? I mean, it, we, we thought it was going to take over. Every parent would rather spend money on first-person uh, first shooters than on edutainment programs. What's the deal? Most of the edutainment software were written by educators and they failed at creating a game that was fun. I mean, I, I, I've been asked to judge edutainment things for 20 years and they're just all God awful. They're just horrible. And I think that there is a particular mindset that game designers have that is absence in the population as a whole. Like we, I would have really good engineers that had no game sense. And, uh, and I think that game sense is something that you get from playing a lot of games, but then when you, when push comes to shove, take that the tyranny of the blank paper <laughs> you know, where you're inventing. Um, you either say that you want this to be in your face educational, or do you want it to be kind of slipped in on the side? 
and slipped in on the side is kind of better. Like, I personally think that Minecraft is a very good educational program. I think it teaches a lot of things, and, and but it's subtle about it, and that uh, that's that's a good thing. Or SimCity. SimCity, precisely. And you know, when you're talking a little bit about uh, uh, emotional learning, there's a guy down here in Los Angeles called Mark Gulitson. He's done a couple of TED Talks. And we're working with him to create some things about mental health and, and you know, resilience. Um, right now, we have a lot of kids that are not robust. They're not tested. They're not challenged. They, 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 they are... They're, they're not hardened life skills. And, uh, and I think that in order to do, in order to be an entrepreneur, you have to believe that you can be successful. If you don't believe you can be successful, you don't ever start. And so this weakness, this, this fragility that a lot of kids are having, you know, helicopter moms and, uh, you know, having their life planned for them 24 seven, I think is really toxic. And uh, we're working on some things to see if we can't get some of these parents to lighten up a little bit. You mean the checklist isn't the end all? No, it's, it's actually toxic. I mean, I, I used to give my three or four year olds hot glue guns and my wife would have say, they're going to burn themselves. Yeah, and then they're going to learn not to burn themselves. <laughs> you know, and because, you know, if you want to teach synthesis, hot glue is the best thing you can because you can stick anything to anything. Right. So I'm um, with games. I mean, there's the question, you know, edutainment. Uh, I, I don't know, even the mixed reality games that Magic Leap put together. They're terrible, just just awful. Right? Just awful. And and you know, not for lack of money. Well, no. There's a there's a theory that I have. Too much money actually dooms a project because all of a sudden there's no feedback for efficacy. It gets it gets swallowed in bureaucracy because. The last thing you want are a whole bunch of people passing judgment because incompetent people will find themselves in management positions and they think that it's cool to say no. And, uh, and so magically failed because they raised too much money. They had too good a demo. And, and, the, and the reality was, was, was different. And, I've talked to several people who worked there and they said it was a political nightmare. Yeah, I worked there. Oh. <laughs> it was a agree? political nightmare. <laughs> it was a political nightmare. Okay. I mean, uh, yeah, it was, it was, yeah. And and uh, no one, yeah. And yeah, yeah, there's lots to say about it. But basically, um, no one really understood. There was no such thing. No one understood what vision was. You know, they really dreamt that they, they knew what a dream was so can you tell tell us a little bit about the difference between somebody walking into your office with a little bit of a dream and somebody really having an idea of what can be solved and, and how to solve it yeah i think you know i told you the story about the guy who came in through my my law firm and and he was all ready to you know, got a non-disclosure and we spent half a day trying to get things. So, and I said, okay, what, what's, what's your project? He said, baseball. And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, you know, you guys know how to program, but you really need to make a baseball game. You know, and I almost threw him out the window <laughs> because, you know, that's not a project that, that, that's, that's just, you know, when you see, hear people say, that person stole my idea, it's not true. 
you were too lazy to do anything about it. Anybody can have an idea. It's not having an idea. That's anybody who's had a shower has had an idea. And anybody who's had a shower has had a good idea. But it's what you do when you get out of the shower, dry off, and start working on it. And then you have to walk up what I call the mountain of reality. First thing you do, you write it down. Second of all, you name it. Third of all, you get the URL. <laughs> Fourth, <laughs> you start trying to figure out what the cost could be. What are the steps to implement? How much would you pay for it? There's this idea of a, of a hollow company where you don't build a product, you just build a sell sheet and you see if you can get a customer and you price it and you do that. And if you can get a customer, then all of a sudden, maybe this is worth, maybe this is worth building. But, you know, starting, starting with building the product before you've marketed, tried to sell the product is a waste of time. So with Chuck E. Cheese, on the other hand, you took a very different direction than Disney did with his animatronic um, entertainment. And you had very specific reasons for it, but it certainly wasn't um, uh, just, just a whim. You thought it through probably pretty carefully to make something that elaborate. Is there any, how, what, where did you get your intuitions? What were you trying to achieve? What, how, how, does that, how did that one all fit together? Well, I knew, you know, I think that when I, what I would, my prime objective was to create an arcade for kids. That was really the, the prime objective. Pizza was there to remind people to come as a family. There were, there, there were, there were and there's still very few venues where young kids and parents can go and have a night out. Um, but I also knew that the kids were going to ha be having fun in the game room and the parents may not. And so the, the animal show was actually more focused for entertaining the adults than it was for the kids. The kids were out and about. So when we designed the animals, we had two or three characteristics. One, a restaurant is a hostile environment for anything electronic. You know, it's just, it just is. And so we knew we had to have a great deal of redundancy and, and robustness. That's why we use pneumatics. Disney used hydraulics. Now, pneumatics has the problem that the pressure to motion is not linear. You know, you, you have to apply air pressure and it gets moving and then it goes really fast. And so, so it didn't give us the quality of animation that the Disney things had, but Hydraulic fluid is really nasty stuff that you don't want to have in a restaurant. So we knew that we were going to have to do that. So we tried to make the animals in such a way that they could be a little bit herky-jerky and it didn't matter. And uh, they did and we did and it worked. And yeah. Well, it's kind of a cartoon playful thing that, that it comes off as, right? Precisely. Yeah. So there's, a, um, I think that, you know, there's something... I mean, you know, I'm trying to get inside of how, what, what is a, what is a, a whole idea, right, a la, a la Nolan. And somebody asked, you know, uh, you know, what, what, what's the metaverse game going to be like? I, I'm not sure that that's, um, well, we'll see if you have anything to say about that. But that's, been yeah, we, that, you know, that, that's the drain we've been circling for the last few years with, um, with Magic Leap and, every, and all these other, and, and Facebook and Microsoft's HoloLens and shit like that. Well, you know, the metaverse is going to be constantly evolving and changing. And in some ways, it's going to re resemble Second Life, you know? And, uh, you know, like 
was that revolutionary? Kinda, but uh, the, the real issue with the metaverse is ownership of IP and the nature of the blockchain. Some people call it Web 3.0. And Web 3.0 is really enabled by the blockchain and the ability to own and have transactions around your creations. NFTs are just one instance of that. You know, the, to the tokens that we're going to be using for the metaverse are going to allow you entrance into an arcade in the metaverse. Now, you're going to be able to be there and, but if you don't have the right tokens in your wallet, you're not going to be, you're going to be barred. You're not going to be allowed to do that. So in some ways, an NFT be, can, can be considered a, a ticket. It can be considered a story. It can be con considered artwork. And uh, it can be considered a real estate. And so it, it, it is really a way of dealing with nouns. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's proper nouns, sometimes it's not. But then once you have the right nouns, you can then deal with things that have some verbs associated with them. Well, I mean, there's this gorgeous stuff. You know, if you take a Facebook VR system or a Magic Leap, they've got all the colors, they've got no pixelation, They've got, re, you know, resolution beyond description. They, they, they match, they'll put, a, they'll put a badge on your chest. They'll have a little robot jumping around you. Um, and, and it's all something you can stand to play with for three minutes. Yeah, if, yeah. <laughs> you know, this is, this is actually kind of an interesting tar uh, topic because the world is constantly changing. And a lot of times what we want is essence and not necessarily gugas. For example, whenever you play chess, there are wonderful chess sets that are hand blown, you know, glass and carved ivory and all that. But if you're playing a tournament game, you play with black and white wood pieces because you want the essence. You don't want the ambiguity of a knight that, or a, a, a bishop that maybe looks a little bit like a pawn. You know, you don't want to have that ambiguity. And so I think as we look at the world of graphical user interfaces and what it means, how good it needs to be. It's, the jury is still out. Let's, here's the question. What is the Turing test for VR? What is the test that says, I can't tell whether I'm in VR or whether I'm in base reality? And I think that right now, Visually, we're probably at 95%, you know, passing the Turing test. Audio, we're at 100%. I can absolutely fool you to think you're in a phone booth or, or a cathedral. Smell, we're at 100% there too, at least with most of the smells. There's probably some weird ones that uh, with, with false lessers that won't get there. But what will break the Turing test, I think, in a VR will be food. Because there you have haptics, you have smell, you have taste. And I think that uh, if I ever have the question, am I in base reality or am I in VR? If I have something to eat, I will know. <laughs> I mean, the thing I wonder is, I'm not sure that perfect fidelity is going to be an advantage. 
I think if I am disoriented because it is 100% passing the Turing test, does that make it a better or worse thing? And that's back to your, to your, uh, your chess pieces. Quite yeah. frankly, the gameplay is the point. And right now, if you, uh, right now they've got a problem where if you put on mixed reality glasses and you try to take an airplane and fly it off of a runway and it shows you the corridor that you're supposed to go on with, you know, the dangers are all over to the side and, and, and something runs across the, the, the runway it turns out people ignore it and they run into it. So that, and so it's, it's, it's actually disorienting to have these orienting structured uh, visuals that are supposed to help you find your way off, off, the, off the tarmac. So I think it's a very complicated question of what, are, what is the illusion we are creating and why and when and how do we keep people, again, um, able to focus on what they're doing and wh why they're doing that and, and uh, be able to succeed at, at having an experience that they value. You know, I'm sure this group is well aware of the fact that our eyes are really not seeing anything. They're seeing points. And what we perceive is all a construct that's being built in our brain. You know, that, that you know, we, our, our vision, isn't what we think it is at all. And that's kind of the basis of illusions and, and, and magic tricks and what have you. But, and, and I'm sure that once we try to deal with these things in the virtual reality and augmented reality world, that those constructs are going to fail just because our eyes are not built that way and that what we're seeing isn't what we're actually seeing. Yeah, but what we're going to experience, hopefully, is going to be educational and entertaining. And we are going to not do something stupid and hurt, kill ourselves because we are pretending to be someplace that we can't possibly be. Well, you know, like with anything new, some of us will kill ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I want to uh, recognize somebody who's been had their hand up for a long time, although you might not have seen it because you haven't been, you've been talking to each other and that's good. Um, Suyash, do you want to say something? I hope that your comment is still relevant. Um, uh, sure, yeah. I, did, I think one of my questions somebody asked, but I do have another question. This is more in general, uh, you know, lessons of like entrepreneurship or game. Uh, I'm very interested in games and educational games as well. Um, but I see so, so much competition in games. Uh, like, you know, you take out your phone, look in the app store or Steam, any pl place like that. How does one stand out, uh, especially if you don't have a big budget, to make a successful game? Like recently there is this game, Wor Wordle got very popular and the guy, just one person who made this game. Uh, so, you know, that's inspiring, but sometimes you look at like people invest like years and millions of dollars and games don't become successful. So what's any advice or tips on that? Be appreciated. Boy, you know, you just, you just articulated the conundrum. I mean, there, there are so many games and there's a lot of really good games that are just invisible, you know, and, uh, and Right now, there are things that have been exciting because they've changed the economic model more than revolutionary games, but they, they have different, I mean, how many people thought, you know, 10 years ago that you could make money on giving games away free and then having game purchases? That was a big deal. And, uh, and so I, I ask myself that same question. And I don't think I'm going to be much help to you because I think it's really hard. And, you know, like Wordle, lightning strikes. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but but I, I actually really enjoyed something you said to me a few years ago when you were making you wink. 
And you were trying to make these games for people that were in a restaurant. And what your insight that you told me was, is that it was better if they were dramatic, but didn't last very long. Be and because that gave them a chance to let the other person show them something else. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, what, what you told me is you wanted, you wanted quantity games. You didn't want quality games and you wanted short games. Is it, yeah. you want to say anything about that experience? How yeah. That? Yeah. I, there's a game class that I call trinkets and their trinkets are, are games that are kind of like junk food. You can play them, you can learn them fast, and but they're not very fulfilling. <laughs> it's, and uh, and those are the kind of games that are really good on your cell phone when you're on the subway or or waiting at a bus stop. You know, you you, you kind of want you don't want to have to really invest a huge amount of time or effort. You just kind of want to have a a fun little thing to it. The uh, the thing that I love about games is the diversity of them. I mean, they're just all over the map and there's so much different things. I mean, I mean, the games that you play on your cell phone are different than the games you play on your Xbox, different than the games that you play on a tablet even. Like Minecraft is really good on a tablet. It's really crappy on a cell phone, uh, you know? And then there's, there's Chromebooks. Chromebooks are really good because they're cheap and they they don't crash and and you know you don't need a system administrator, so it's becoming the go-to piece of hardware for schools now, and and it's and they're cheap, and uh, you know mind-bogglingly cheap and uh, and it's I mean remember Negroponte with his hundred-dollar laptop, yes. we got it. We, you know, I just saw some some Chromebooks for a hundred bucks, and I said, "Geez, you know, that didn't take long." <laughs> so um, this idea of casual games, uh, Stacy Ricardo uh, brings up, and and I think that that's kind of related to this this idea. Um, and what I really um, think also, you you were talking, you know, we were talking about in the in the restaurant, but now that we are spending all of our time uh, hanging around in bars by ourselves while we wait for our friends or or walking while we're playing with our, we're walking our dog and we're playing game the games i think the gameplay might be um again uh different because of the place we're in as well as the different device we're on do you want to say anything about that yeah um my partner and i developed a game two years ago which won the CES Innovation of the Year Award. And it's called, it's called Saint Noir. It's not a video game. It's a game that was played using Amazon Echo. And so one of the things that, think of a board game as being a different kind of structure. It's where you are elbow to elbow with other players. And because you're not focused on the screen, you can focus on each other. And so I believe that a social game using smart speakers, the AI from smart speakers, Saint Noir is a murder mystery game. And what you're doing is you are using your voice to interview suspects. And the suspects have to tell the truth. The perp can lie. And so the game is about figuring out who's lying, who's telling the truth to catch the guy. And, uh, it's a lot of fun and we're going we've got two or three other games that we want to do one of these days we, we've got them all packed out and and we really got into learning how to program the the echo ecosystem 
and uh, I'm actually right now doing an in, a design. Have you, have you guys done escape rooms? Well, imagine I'm I'm going to do some escape rooms in which we have an echo there um, or a Google Home, and so that now you are asking questions. And there's another benefit there. Escape rooms are fun if you're winning. They're really not fun if you're lost. And so by having Echo there sort of moderating what's going on, we can tell if you're behind in time and we can give you a hint automatically. And so my escape rooms are going to be uh, uh, a little different. and. Uh, and, and, you know, now the echo ecosystem with lights and, and all the other things you can do, it's really, really fun. You, you, uh, and then you link up some Arduino and a little bit of, I, I still like to play with pneumatics. Hook up some pneumatics to the echo and all of a sudden you can really mess with your environment. <laughs> so one, one question that came up earlier that we hadn't got to was, the value of haptics um, in an in interface. Um, and I really believe, I mean, people cannot type on a keyboard that does not give them touch feedback very fast at all. Um, so do you want to say something about uh, physicality? Yeah, I, I, like, I like haptics. There was a very interesting thing that I experienced, wow, probably 30 years ago. And it was a sort of a, think of it as a concave mannequin, meaning that you could actually move up and, and, and you didn't have to put it on, you just had to lean against it. And, uh, and you were in VR, leaning against this, and it had these little percussion things so that if you got shot, it'd go boom, and give you a little bit of a tap. Great fun. It was really good. And then it, then it went away. Uh, I don't know where it is. There's another haptic thing that I saw at a SIGGRAPH in which you actually held onto a cylinder and it had vibrations in such a way that it could create the image in your brain of these objects. It was the damnedest thing I ever did. I never did figure out how they were doing it, but uh, I kept going back until they wouldn't let me do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a lot you can do with a little bit of haptics too. And, you know, I remember us rocking a pole position arcade game at Atari back and forth and it feeling completely different just with a physical person doing it. And, you know, um, you know, there was a there was a lovely demo in 1989 uh, at SIGGRAPH where they had you hanging two inches off the ground while you put on some VR glasses and 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 pulled on two strings to, to control your parachute. And in using that to teach people, they were able to reduce the number of injuries in training people to parachute by ten times. Oh, I can believe that. Yeah, yeah. and you know, literally. Those two strings, it's just two, two, I mean, it's literally two optical encoders <laughs> and that's it. You know, we should do that. You know, my son has a uh, micro amusement park called Two Bit Circus. I don't know if you've heard of it. I've heard you talk about it. And it is incredible. And uh, we're, we create a lot of games that are bespoke for that location. And uh, in fact, my, my escape rooms are going to go in there. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm actually a really lucky guy. Uh, I have eight kids and uh, four, five boys and three girls. And, but all my boys are in some kind of a game construct. And so when we go into Two Bit Circus, a third of the games that are on the floor were designed by my kids. <laughs> So now, is that, am I, am I proud? Yes. 
pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty cool. Um, so two bit circus, uh, we can look it up online and learn more about it. Uh, yeah, and come down when you're in LA. It's in the arts district of downtown LA. It's great fun. I'll come down sometime. Um, so um, we are coming up on, uh, you know, it's 840, but that does not mean we have to stop. What it means is uh, there's a general uh, question from uh, Christina uh, uh, Garay. Mm -hmm. Yes, perfect. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, hi. Um, so I mostly have a general question. I'm currently in school studying user interface and user experience design and barely starting out in the field. Do you possibly have any tips for a person starting in user experience and user interface design? I think that um, being good at something is important if you become intuitive you've got to feel things you know you and and and, and i think that i think that if you're going to be a good designer just do a lot of designing and and be willing i generally don't like focus groups but when it comes to things like design I do. And what you want to do is see where people struggle when they're, yeah, and, and you want, you want newbies, you know, virgins that have never done this before. Is it intuitive to them? And what you want to be able to do is always focus on the person that you think is the dumbest person in the room. You got to win them over. Because a lot of times in an environment of fun, a person's IQ drops by as much as 30 points. You know, add alcohol, it drops another three, <laughs> another 10 points. So, so they're basically blithering idiots in a bar or a restaurant. So you've got to really focus on having something that's fun for a blithering idiot, and, uh, and 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 I don't mean to be respect disrespectful, but that's just the reality. Alcohol and dope plus fun equals stupidity every time. <laughs> uh, also, what what also is stupidity is when you feel like you're on the spot, and yeah. and the the thing about the focus, the, the question of of letting somebody stupid try something, the stupidest person is you don't necessarily want to prime them. You want them to act. You want to present it as though they would have, the experience that they would have had if they had no support around them and they were uh, in that awful place with that loud music and the, and the, and the, and the, you know, and, and the people that they can't meet and the, you know, and they just got off work and their boss yelled at them and all of that. Yeah. You know, I was being very disrespectful to my customers. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I, I bet we have another um, interesting question about um, about the history or future of uh, Nolan's uh, projects and ways of thinking about uh, creating things. Any, uh, please. Uh, Maybe, maybe, uh, yeah, Does any, who, who would like to go next? And we'll just do this a couple more times and then we'll start closing down. I can definitely ask a question. It's a kill, by the way. Um, turn on my camera back again. Hi, everyone, I'm back. Um, so Nola, this question is kind of specific to you and the realms that you play in. Um, specifically, what realm, because let's just, let's just like cut it to the chase that it is, that gaming is now the space that you, I would arguably say you're a founder of, uh, the space is massive now. There's so much innovation going on, whether it's now not just video games as an industry itself, but education, training that I mentioned, so many other spaces. Do you see any pitfalls within the user experience because it's becoming so vast? Or do you think that's only good for growth? Like there's no downside to it? Well, 
Do I believe that there are going to be some really crappy experiences developed? Yes. <laughs> um, it's just the nature of the world. What, what I'm always looking for is something like I don't like to, to do things that I've done before. I, I, like, I like to be inventive. I mean, that's why I had so much fun doing the echo thing. You know, no video, no nothing. How do you, how do you create this environment where you, everybody's having a good time? And, uh, and so, you know, can we take people to a place just through sound, you know? When you're interviewing the cocktail waitress, do you need to hear the glasses and, and the jukebox playing? When you're in, you know, when you're interviewing the sheriff, you want to have people in the holding cell giving him bad time. You know, it's a matter of, of creating this, this other thing. One of the things I'm working on right now is this idea of, and, and it's called Weird Woods. Think of it as a campground, glamp ground, you know, where you have a, a tent with a toilet and a shower and, and uh, you know, linens on your bed. So it's, so it's a, it's a camping experience, but it's not, it's, it's roughing it. You know, it's not roughing it. You know, it's not roughing it. Now let's add games. Let's add experiences. And so one of the things we're doing is we're going to have escape trails, not escape rooms, escape trail, because now we can do that out in the woods. Now we have zip lines with virtual reality. What about mole meadow? Where now you have a, me a, a meadow that we have life-size moles that pop up and you have to run around with a sledgehammer and beat them down. What, what about having a laser tag arena or a gauntlet where as you move along, bad guys pop up and you have to shoot them with your laser gun? The whole idea of can we turn a campground into a micro amusement park and uh, that's kind of a project that I'm currently hatching and and I've got it up to about 20 games we'll probably test and wheedle it down to eight to ten but um, but I think that but have any of you been to a uh, Great Wolf Lodge Great Wolf Lodge has a very interesting niche. It's basically an hour away from two city centers. Like there's one that's about an hour from Seattle and an hour from Portland. So it's sort of halfway in between, an hour and a half. And they have games in a water park. And it's for a micro vacation. Parents with kids, they would like to go out for you know, they don't want to spend a huge amount of money, but they'll spend a little bit to have a hotel room. And, and these hotel rooms in, in the Great Wolf food, you know, there's one that has tents and bunk beds that look like they're in the tent. And they're, it's really fun. And the and a water park. Well, I believe we can do the same thing with a glamp ground that, uh, but a a glamp tent costs 20,000 bucks. The typical hotel room of the budget hotel has a capex of 300,000. And you can rent them for more money. You know, a, a, the, the glamp ground that I went to last summer, we paid $300 a night for, for a damn tent. Uh, it was a nice tent, but, <laughs> but it was, you know, when you think about it, it's... Uh, compared to the 90 bucks for Best Western. Um, it was really, it, it's really an interesting environment. So I think there's an opportunity there. Yeah. And campgrounds right now, particularly with COVID, 
are right now you you if you want to buy a campground that's operational you have to pay five times revenue that's stupid revenue not earnings five times revenue it's because it's a stable cash flow anyway so um this um this this idea well one one person asked about um books are there any books that you think people uh should consider reading that you've the, you know besides the one you wrote two or three years ago well i've got a i've got two books coming out this year i've got one that's called exodexa school of the future which is sort of the manifesto of my education company and in fact look up exodexa online and you'll see my education company uh and my science fiction book is finally going to come out. The COVID, you know, staying at home, I decided I was going to get some of my half done projects off my plate. And so uh, I think in April, May, um, Video Games 2071, which is my science fiction book, it's all about nano architecture and, and, and you know, haptics and, and uh, virtual reality and the games and, and I said video games 2071 because it's a hundred year anniversary of the video game. And so I thought that would be kind of fun. <laughs> but I like Neil Stevenson. I've read almost everything that he's done. I love my absolute favorite, though, is Hi the Hyperion series from Dan Simmons. It's a four book series. And it is a thick read, and it is mind-boggling. I recommended this to a bunch of people. And I'd say half of the people I've recommended it to can't get through it. It's a, it's a thick read, but it's a wonderful story. Love it. I'm also, I've also kind of enjoyed, there's a Chinese author who did the three body problem and ball lightning. He, and I can't say his name, it's Kicks and Lee or something like that. And uh, the thing I like about it, it's very, very different thinking. And, uh, and then of course there's uh, Lee Child's, the Jack Reacher series. It's not science fiction, but it's just, a, it's great trashy novels. <laughs> we have a hand raised from Ricardo, Stacy. Ricardo, you want to speak up? Hi, uh, yeah, sorry, I don't have my webcam plugged in so you can't see me, but uh, I just wanted to ask, because you've mentioned about uh, technology in education. I want to know your thoughts about technology and therapy, for example, psychotherapy. So let's say maybe somebody has a you know, fear of heights, maybe you, you could use VR to put them in a simulation where they get exposed to heights and then maybe you graduate that to the real world. Um, do you think that has, you know, any uh, viable application? I, I think that oh, all these things are possible and to be determined. Um, I do know that we can, we're working on a game right now that is that we think can give kids a little more robustness. What we want to do is, is, is stress them a little bit and let them get through it. I was talking, Mark, if you want to look up Mark Gulliskson, he's got several TED Talks, smart guy. He's a clinical psychiatrist. And, and we're working to try to make kids particularly high school girls have a very, very high suicide rate. And uh, to see if we can't make them feel better and uh, not take things so seriously. You know, if you don't get a date to the prom, your life does not end, <laughs> you know. And yes, boyfriends are shits. You got to realize that very early on. You know, there's actually very, very good studies that have shown 
that girls that have brothers are much happier, more happily married because girls kind of understand early on that, that men are very different. And, uh, and so I think the more that we can give these lifestyle questions vent, uh, we can create more psychologically robust individuals. Well, I think that this is um, um, really, really a, been a bit of fascinating hour and a half here. And um, as, as we're, uh, you know, and it's really, I mean, it's been a remarkable forum. Uh, I didn't quite, you know, we didn't quite know how we were going to go and it's been going great. Um, and uh, I think that the, uh, the point now is for us to, uh, to thank you, Nolan, for, for all that you've been doing and all that you're going to do and, uh, and for sharing, giving us a chance to, to see, see a little bit into some of those projects and the way you think about them. Um, and it really um, is, is uh, quite inspiring. And I hope a lot of people take away this idea that you really do have to dive in and really get great at what you're doing and just uh, really take seriously um, being honest about whether or not <laughs> it can be, it, somebody other than you can enjoy whatever you've built. Um, and I think that that was, uh, you know, for me, a very special, um, statement you made um about the you know what you used the word focus group but i think it was a lot about that that you know the 30 to, the 60 uh iq points that we lose when we're uh, not not uh, all 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 geared up for what we're doing so um with that nolan i know that you um before this meeting started i know you were being told that dinner was was warm and on the table and uh i'm really sorry well, that's okay. I, you know, I eat cold food all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I just want to apologize deeply for, no for, for making that be true this evening for you. Well, um, see, that's, that, that's actually my wife's problem because she has access to my calendar and, she, and I have this on the calendar. So she, she just wasn't paying attention. Right, right. And uh, so I think that, that that's, you know, none of us are paying attention. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Well, it's all nice to meet you all, and I wish you luck in your life. And, you know, just do everything with enthusiasm. You know, just be enthusiastic and, and then be happy. And, you know, why, we live in amazing times right now. You know, and, you know, when I think about how easy it is to program things now compared to back in the days, I actually knew machine language at one time. You know, talk about a worthless skill. <laughs> um, you know, on that on that level, when you were uh, the thing, the fact is that artists have typically, you know, spent the last five hundred years playing with with uh, oil paint. You know, and and then they started stacking up televisions thirty years ago, but they didn't really know how to get inside them. It really took Nolan to get inside them, and I think that the point is that. That in terms of this running out of out of runway for his good videos, uh, good good games, the technologies are enabling us yeah. more and more fancier and fancier paintbrushes. And if we understand that paint, that that technology deeply, that's when we can use our creativity and our artistry to do something fabulous. And I think that's part of the deal. You know, I want to leave you with something that I do. I think that you can often get surprising results by mashing dissimilar things together. So for example, when tectonic plates collide, that's where all the earthquakes and, and uh, volcanoes exist. Now, what happens when you collide a car and a computer? Is that a self-driving car? Is it a car that does interesting things? What happens when you mesh a Amazon Echo with a board game? What do you come up with? You know, these are new venues because you're basically pushing together dissimilar things that haven't been done before. So take 
something from item from column A, mash it with column B, and just think about it. And a lot of times you can find some really interesting threads there. And with that, I will say adieu. <laughs> Thanks for the mashup. Be good. <laughs> Bye now. Good night.